Hey everybody, Coach Toolshed here, and in today's video we're going to be discussing some very serious topics. So if you feel like you are unable or unwilling to hear some thoughts that go against your current mindset, then just be aware that I'm probably not going to be saying things that you'll 100% agree with, no matter which side of the argument you reside on. And of course, the argument I'm referring to today is The Last of Us Part 2, the recent firestorm that is currently burning after the review embargo lifted for the game on Friday. Now, to the surprise of no one that's been paying attention, the game has received massively high aggregate scores on Metacritic, and I'm not trying to say that the game necessarily deserves it or doesn't deserve it, but that's not the question here. What I'm saying is the game was always going to get great scores for several factors. Now, one side of the argument has loudly declared that the reviews must all be paid shills, while the other side is foolishly trying to use the tired old, it's a uh, 96 on Metacritic, so therefore that shuts down all conversation and they really have no other point. Now, both these sides here are not really correct, and we're going to be talking about some of that stuff today, but the undercurrents of 2014 have rapidly re-escalated now, and anyone who isn't falling in lockstep with the righteous praising of the game must, of course, be one of those horrible, terrible people that Neil Druckmann has been warning us about for many years, and we're going to get to that very soon, because that's the huge problem with this entire scenario. The other side is being accused of being mindless sheep who are stupid enough to believe IGN and other mainstream outlets as trustworthy review sources. The few reviewers who gave the game generally negative reviews are being hailed as heroes on one side and being treated as social pariahs by the other. Give the game a bad review and you must be inherently honest, say some, while the rest are obviously getting paid off. That's how the story goes. Now, we've obviously seen this cycle repeat itself throughout the years with many different games, but this time it feels a little bit different, and it really shouldn't. You see, there's really only one real villain here as I see it, and it's not actually the mystery woman that no one is allowed to talk about in the game. All of the animosity and vitriol in the current conversation can really be traced back to one man by the name of Neil Druckmann. To explain what I'm talking about, you, you must know Neil Druckmann, of course, he's the writer and director for the game, but to explain what I'm talking about, step back with me, if you will, to the year 2013. In that year, we saw a new generation of consoles released, but largely they launched without many new games. Most talked about games of that year were Grand Theft Auto V, of course, which went on to be a massive success. We had Bioshock Infinite, which got a lot of praise, but there was one new IP that really started coming out of nowhere and racking up award out of award, and it kind of just came out of nowhere, and it was one of those rare games that gets praised almost universally by both critics and players alike. Now, of course, some people didn't like the game, but the game, of course, what I'm talking about is The Last of Us. Now, when we're talking about this game, I'm going to be discussing characters from the original game and I'm going to be discussing some of the storylines that happen to them. So if you're someone who's excited to play the next game and you're maybe wanting to play the first game through this week, just be aware I'm about to discuss some of the original game's side characters to make my overall point here. 2013 was a very different time in gaming, especially when it came to the conversation around games. The mainstream gaming media had not yet launched their war against gamers as a general group. The YouTube was very big back in 2013, but it's not nearly as ubiquitous as it is today with so much different coverage on YouTube. It certainly has exploded in the last seven years, there's no doubt about that. Twitch was around, but it was really barely on the radar. I'm sure many of you might remember that Ustream was actually one of the preferred streaming platforms that was available on PlayStation 4 when it first came out, and Twitch was really just kind of there as well. It, it was not, again, not nearly as ubiquitous as what we see today. So there was a lot less coverage at the time, and as I said, you did not have the media with their all-out hate campaign against their uh, the hobbyist enthusiasts that follow the gaming sites. They hadn't started that yet, so the conversation was very, very different. Now, in 2013, The Last of Us Part 1 launched to massive praise from the majority of players and critics alike. At the time, people praised the characters, not only Joel and Ellie, the main characters, but also the very strong supporting cast as well. 
you see, and right now we're going to be getting into some spoilers here, so just, you've been warned. First off, one of the main characters you meet is a character like Tess. Now, she is Joel's business partner at the start of the game, and she's capable and very dangerous in the way she is portrayed in the game. People respect Tess. She is clearly a capable operative in the dangerous Boston zone of the game. The story implies that she's actually the one in charge between her and Joel, and the enemy you catch in the first area seems as fearful of Tess as he does of Joel. Clearly, she is meant to be a tough character, and indeed, she proves to be mentally tough as well, as she ultimately sacrifices herself to save the escape of Joel and Ellie. One of the f uh, first scenes in the game that show you where the writing was really willing to go was the scene where Tess sacrifices herself. It's a great scene and really a memorable character. Later on, after that, you meet Marlene. Now, she's in charge of the Fireflies, one of the militant groups in the game, and she appears, once again, much like Tess, to be a strong leader. Despite the fact that she is wounded when you meet her, it's clear that she is well-respected and people know her and fear her in some ways. She is a powerful individual in the story, and she ultimately becomes the game's de facto villain by the end of the game now. It depends on how you view the game and Joel's decision at the end. She might not necessarily be a villain in your eyes, but she's portrayed that way. She's certainly the antagonist to Joel by the end of the game. Definitely another very strong and memorable character. Now let's talk about Bill. Bill is a much-beloved character, one of my favorite characters from the first game. He's a survivalist, he's a little bit mad, he's very entertaining, and he's the focal point for the middle part of the game when you're escaping from his town and the high school chapter as you make your way to secure a vehicle and head into Pittsburgh. And to this very day, I will defy you to find a more deadly AI companion in any game. In fact, if you let yourself just try to stay alive during the areas where you and Bill fight off the clickers. He can actually take out every single enemy in your path if you can survive long enough to let him. Very tough companion and very well written character and everyone loved Bill. There's really no one that had a problem with Bill. And in fact, I think he's one of Naughty Dog's better set companions that they've ever made. Soon after this, you meet Henry and Sam. After a couple of nerve-wracking chapters with them, the story abruptly ends with one of the most impactful cutscenes I've ever seen in any game. Even without a word of dialogue at the end, that scene was one that I will think about every time that I think about The Last of Us Part 1. Truly a great side story and some great side characters, and really, when you're talking about having divergent characters in your game, the storyline and the chapters with Sam and Henry are some of the most memorable that you're going to find. It's at this point where the stakes of the game seem to raise even higher as you see the instant despair crossing over Henry's face. This is an unforgiving world, and as he takes his final action, his ultimate failure to protect Sam is his final thought. The knowledge of this and watching this scene for Joel and Ellie really solidifies their relationship much more than it ever was before. They, were, they really were very tenuous up until that point, and it is at that point of the game that they really started to realize how much they relied on one another. It's a pivotal part of the game, two very important side characters with a very well-written story, and that is one of the most memorable scenes of the entire game. Now, where am I going with all of this? Well, it's pretty simple, really, if you think about it, but this seems to be getting lost in the discussion entirely. See, back in 2013, all of these characters, critics and players, by and large, loved these characters. And every one of them is integral to the setting and story for the game. Back in 2013, however, things were very, very different. The vitriol in the, in the discussion over games was not anywhere near the levels it has reached now. Consider this, though. All these characters were universally praised at the time, despite the fact that they were all, in some sense, characters that would today be used as ammunition in the gaming war between developers and the game-buying public. In 2020, The Last of Us Part 1, if it released, would be getting praised by some for its diverse cast and criticized by others for being pandering to the Twitter crowd. Yet in 2013, it was just Tess, subverting stereotypes and sacrificing herself for Joel in the ultimate and final act of her life. 
The fact that she's a female wasn't a source of praise or contention, she was just a great side character. Marlene was viewed as a strong, dangerous foe for anyone who played the game. Her being a female minority was really irrelevant to the story. It was just Marlene that mattered. No one was mad about her, which is in direct contrast to the name Dean character in Uncharted 4. Both lead some sort of quasi-military group, but one was a well-written character and one was not. Also, the conversation at the time when Uncharted 4 came out was part of the point here. The conversation had drastically changed by that point, and that is where some of the vitriol is coming from that we're discussing now. Let's talk about Bill. Bill was one of everyone's favorite characters. The fact that he was gay wasn't his defining feature, however. No one was angry about it at the time either. No one's angry about it now. He was a great character. He was defined by his character and the actions he took in the game, not by some checklist that Neil Druckmann felt that he had to include in the game. It, it was irrelevant. Once again, he was just a good character. Sexuality didn't matter at all, and everyone loved the character. Henry and Sam had some of my favorite divergent chapters in the game. The sewer chapter that you go through with them has some great side stories, and when you get split up between Joel and and Ellie and, and, and Sam and Henry and the two groups have to split up and go. Those are some of the best chapters in the entire game. However, the fact that they are minorities wasn't part of the story. They just were. And that's the important thing about what I'm talking about here. See, these characters weren't getting complained about before. There wasn't some sort of vitriol being thrown at the characters or the writing, mainly because at the time, game developers, and in this case, Neil Druckmann, hadn't started throwing shade at the audience. They hadn't started attacking anyone who may have a problem preemptively with anything that they write down the line. Now, all this brings me to the biggest fallacy behind Neil Druckmann's current crusade, and that is actually his non-stop discussion of Ellie as a character at this point. Now, I got a newsflash for you, Neil. Ellie went down after the original game as one of the most beloved characters in gaming history. Show me somewhere that exists this mysterious group of hateful people who just can't stand Ellie as a character. It, it really doesn't exist anywhere except in Neil Druckmann's Twisted Logic. You see, in 2020, what he's doing is he's attempting to wield the fact that Ellie is a lesbian character as a cudgel to beat naysayers into submission. Again, newsflash Neil, we've known about Ellie being a lesbian since the Left Behind DLC six years ago. It wasn't met with a tidal wave of hate. Everyone accepted her because they liked her character. It's her. The people are connecting with her. Her sexuality fit the character, so it all worked, and no one got upset about it. Literally, no one had a problem with it in 2013. Now, apparently in 2020, it's some sort of major problem in the mind of Neil Druckmann. What Neil Druckmann is doing here has been going on with him for years. What he's done is set up an invisible boogeyman army that he thinks needs his message. Those are his words, not mine. He's attempting the tired old trick of equating all questioning and criticism of his latest game and story as the work of these terrible people. When he and others at Naughty Dog keep saying stuff like, we make games for our fans, not for bigots. This instantly draws a line that implies that if you aren't 100% on board with his games, then you must, by default, be a bigot. I mean, this is just absurd, but this is the attack that he's taking. This type of talk nowadays inevitably is met by a chorus of anger being launched back at the developers, which is then in turn used by the developers as proof that their message is needed now more than ever. Again, this is exactly the sort of quotes you're hearing from Neil Druckmann right now, that these people who are having a problem with his story or his writing, they need his message more than anyone else because they're the problem. It's not the fact that he's the type of person that starts the division. No, 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 no. That's got nothing to do with it. It's not the fact that everyone loved the last game and the characters. Oh, no, no, no. Now he's going to 
you, you know, now he's got to preach to you. Now he's got to start moralizing. And the problem with all of this is that it's sheer stupidity. Having a diverse cast of characters is fine, and most people don't have a problem with it. The problem is when you start throwing it out there as if you need to be praised because of the cast that you wrote. It's ridiculous. And quite honestly, most people buy it. And I'm talking about when I say most, I mean 99% of people do not have a problem. It's the problem of when you start jamming it down our throats and acting like you are some sort of messiah. That's the problem. Uh, it, pick your favorite food. Everyone has a favorite food that they like. They love to eat it. But you know what you don't want? You don't want someone coming up and being like, oh, I hear this is your favorite food. Let me start jamming it down your throat or pouring it into your mouth. It, it, nobody wants that. It doesn't matter what it is. And if it's something that you're trying to cram down people's throat and hammer them in the face with it, you're going to be met with resistance, especially when you're trying to paint that other side as evil if they're not actively praising you for it. It's the height of narcissism. It's the height of just junior high level mentality of what diversity is or what it actually means at all. When in reality, if you just treat people like you want them to be treated, I know it's cliche, but that really is the reality. If you treat people decently, guess what? They'll treat you back decently. The thing is, Naughty Dog and Neil Druckmann already made a game with a diverse cast, but they were able to do so without patting themselves on the back, and everyone liked the game. So now running around and calling everyone who potentially has an issue with what he has planned for Joel in part two, like there's some sort of evil, hateful person, is just asinine. Pulling this card out now is pathetic, and it only shows that Neil Druckmann is someone who's writing for Twitter points and not necessarily trying to write the best story. Now, I know just saying that will paint me as some sort of hateful person in somebody's eyes, but it is pretty clear that that's what's going on here because he didn't need to pat himself on the back for part one, but for part two, it's an all-out crusade, and it's clear and obvious as anything else. Neil Druckmann needs to understand he's not some sort of messiah that needs to preach or moralize to everybody. Almost everyone, I would say, watching this video has relatives and friends that he's now attempting to use as a shield for any criticism that might come along with this game. It's a blight on modern social discussion, and the mentality is from 30 years ago. Get over yourself, guy. You're the only one who's trying to use this divide that did not exist with your last game. The same people you're castigating now are the same ones who bought your game before, and in some cases bought your game twice with the remastered version. They didn't have a problem with your characters. You've sold millions and millions of copies of this game. Like I said, many people buying the game twice, and now those are the same people you're trying to attack. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling. On the other side of the coin, Anyone getting mad now at The Last of Us 2 because of the cast specifically seems to be forgetting the main cast of people from the original game. Don't let the media or the commentariat on the reviews make you go insane. The baiting isn't going to stop until they have no more tweets or comment threads to cry about, and we know that. We have to be smarter than they are if we want to put a stop to this, which shouldn't be too hard because the way they're acting is very foolish, but it seems to be a lot of red meat out there for a lot of people. I would urge you to ease up because it's only going to give them more ammunition to act like fools, but the media is going to go right along with it, and we're going to continue to get this animosity and this lack of availability of actual conversation and nuance when it comes to to gaming reviews specifically. Now, when you're a fan of something, that just means that you're able to question things. It doesn't mean that you have to be a fanboy and follow everything a developer says. People questioning the story for The Last of Us 2 aren't evil, no matter how much the media says they are. Nonsense about true fans should be ignored. Neil Druckmann's junior high-level mentality and moralizing totally ignores the praise of millions of people for part one of The Last of Us. People are not mad that you're playing as Ellie. They're mad because of why they're not playing as Joel. 
Those are two entirely different things. Stop being grossly disingenuous. You've already held the conversation back by seven years now, Neil. Why don't you stop talking? Because every time you open your mouth for another one of these interviews, you set the clock back again and again. Now look, honestly, from an objective standpoint, just looking at the game itself and the clips we've seen, it obviously looks like on a technical level it achieves some things that other games simply haven't done. So as far as that goes, it probably is a game worthy of praise in that regard. Now as far as the story goes, how are we supposed to know? Honestly, you have certain things that we know or we think we know. Even people who are reviewing the game are being coy about everything. There's NDAs involved and everything else. But the fact is, there's only been a hundred or so people actually been able to give their opinion about the game officially. And some people here on YouTube. So maybe a couple hundred all told. At the end of the day, I don't really care about early reviews coming from people who got free copies of the game and are, at the end of the day, in the access journalist industry. They need to maintain friendly relations, so I really don't care what any of them say. And yeah, you have some big outlets involved, and you also had a lot of big omissions. You have channels here on YouTube with 10,000 subscribers that apparently got early review copies, and then you have much more well-respected reviewers with almost a half million or more, some cases 700,000 subscribers, who didn't get review copies. So as you can see there's kind of a discrepancy there. Now, am I saying that it's all collusion? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, you're going to be a lot more prone to be giving games great reviews if you're trying to rely on access. doesn't need to be any payments involved. It's all about the access. Anyway, that's it for me, Coach Toolshed. I could go on with this for a while on some other different branches, but I think I've said enough for this for today when the game actually comes out next week actually it's th the end of this week i am planning on reviewing it so i will let you know my unbiased opinion at that time anyway that's it for me coach tools let me know what you guys think down in the comments below please subscribe if you want to stay in tune with the channel headed forward and as always keep it turned to 11.